Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Following me and sharing my videos is really important. I'm a one-man shop with absolutely no money for advertising, so social media, that's the way I grow. So please do follow me on Twitter, at SYLTales, or any other social media you can find. I'm on, every, I'm on everyone known to man. You can find them on this channel's description. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch stores on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Well, since you've come to this review looking for a review of Doctor Who Season 12, Episode 4, Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, then I suppose you've probably already watched the video, and I hope so. But for safety's sake, I suppose I should issue myself a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fandom master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me, and that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about a half an hour too early. This is neither a boast nor a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for the entire century that came before, and you find out there's not much new in the world, and it sometimes it interferes with your ability to enjoy things. The short version review of this episode is very simple. It's okay. It's not a brilliant episode, certainly nothing that's going to be remembered. Unfortunately, that's the case with almost all of the Chibnall-era Doctor Who episodes. With other modern Doctor Who doctors, there are episodes that you will remember. But can you think of anything during the Chibnall era that comes to mind? I mean, the best that I can think of is probably Skyfall, but that's not memorable due to the Doctor. It's rather due to the Master. In terms of great moments, we always like to say something nice about the episode. Well... It wasn't overtly political. <laughs> Unlike most of the other episodes, it wasn't overtly political, and that was a good thing. It wasn't irritatingly injecting identity politics, nor scientific claptrap like the global uh, uh, doomsday scenario, the climate doomsday scenario. Uh, it wasn't trying to make Americans look bad. You know, I mean, Edison was kind of a bad dude, but that's how he was in real life. They weren't, you know, saying that that's an indictment of everything American, which they sometimes do. That is about all I can say that's good about that. <laughs> so let's get into cringe moments. Now, in general, these forays into Earth's past are becoming rather tedious. They're no doubt educational for some people, but they're going back in time and meeting a lot of people that I already know about. As a computer scientist, I'm extremely aware of what Tesla accomplished, how he died in poverty, and his, um, his, uh, the fact that he had a rivalry with Edison and Edison, all his business acumen rather than being an actual inventor, and how Edison undercut uh, Tesla at every turn. It was a terrible thing going on then. You really should know about it. But I know about this stuff. And I know that, in fact, Tesla was responsible for much of what we take granted now. But this isn't news to me. Now, if it's used news to you, you should probably learn more history and probably more history in general. And for Nikola Tesla in particular, I have created a link in my description box below to him on Wikipedia. Read all about him. So that's one of my cringe moments, just the fact that this is stuff I already know. You know, I don't need to be told this particular, st particular story. Another cringe moment? Why? Why? Did they need early 20th century technology to solve this problem? Surely the TARDIS can do it all by itself. I mean, the whole energy field or something was powered by the TARDIS anyway. Why? Why do you need late 19th, early 20th century technology? Doesn't make any sense. Other things, other real cringe moment. Um, why did the king of that scorpions look humanoid, at least partially? I mean, all the rest of them, all the rest... Every single one were giant scorpions. So why did the queen of them look different? Doesn't make any sense. Now I'm going to go into uh, the use of language for a bit. 
It's bothersome to me because, as my longtime viewers know, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor. I was never a very good actor, and uh, I liked money a lot more, so I went into a far more successful and lucrative career as a computer scientist. However, one of the things I do well is dialects. I have a very good ear for it, and it was one of the very few things <laughs> that people ever told me that I was very good at when I was acting. If I hear a language or a dialect for any length of time, less than an hour typically, if I hear a native speaker speaking it, I can probably reproduce it. I also studied linguistics a lot more than most actors. I know two phonetic alphabets, which means if I get a copy of a dialect in a phonetic alphabet, I can also reproduce it. Now, the British never really get the cadence of American speech and the use of certain words and pronunciation quite right. The most glaring example of this in this episode was the word patent. Now, patent is pronounced patent in the United States, yet it was consistently being pronounced patent in the episode. Well, that's, that is, patent is a British pronunciation. The American pronunciation is patent. And there were other examples, um, particularly in cadence. Now, the British English and American English have a different cadence. That is how words are pronounced in context, how we highlight different words emotionally, and how they're pronounced when they're all put together as sentences. Now, Tesla, in real life, he didn't speak with a general American dialect. He was an Austrian immigrant whose accent was very more similar to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And amazingly, there's actually a recording of this. His voice does survive, and I've got a uh, link to that in my description box as well. It's on YouTube. Now, I want to make a quick note about the general American dialect. It is artificial. There is no one in the United States who speaks this dialect natively. They are trained for it. Now, it is similar to my own natural accent, that of the Central and Upper Great Plains of the United States. However, where you find it most is by news commentators. They use, uh, broadcasters and reporters always use general American is what they use. It's also used by actors who might have a native accent that's so radically different uh, that it would really keep them from working, except for characters who had their accent. Now, as much as possible, in point of fact, I use the general American accent for this show. And I do it precisely because... It's a dialect used by newscasters. I use it in order to make my voice more generalized than my own native dialect and hopefully sound a little better. But always, 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 as I point out, remember the theatrical nature of anything that you see in any form of video. And look at my production values. They're a little bit different from most of the YouTubers. But the difference for me is that when I use my own theatricality and it becomes an issue on my show, I will tell you outright about it, such as the fact that I am using general American dialect rather than my own native one. Now, the best way that I can tell you how general American differs from a real dialect like my natural one is by giving you kind of an example, and I'll read the next paragraph after this in my own natural accent. So on the show, you might hear me say, just because. That's how we pr not pronounce it in general American, but not in my native dialect. In my native dialect, just because comes out like just because. We routinely you say, I'm gonna, rather than I'm going to. In fact, I'm going to is almost never found in the Central and Upper Great Plains. I particularly struggle with the word particularly, because in my own native dialect, it's more pronounced particularly. And I'll give you a paragraph here in my own native dialect, if I can force it back to it. I get used to doing it, and then I have to think about dropping it, which makes it all weird. So the next paragraph of my script, in my native Central and Upper Great Plains dialect. There are ample examples, but you get the drift. General American isn't a real dialect. However, unless there's a story that takes place Somewhere in a particular region of the U.S., British actors almost always use General American. And there's, unless there's a story again. And, and when they, oftentimes when they do do a story in a particular area of the country, like Southern, <laughs> there are about a jillion Southern accents. And if they, they do something in the Southern part of the United States, usually it's really cringingly bad. That is my, my native accent. Now, I don't really begrudge... 
um, them too much. Because even in the UK, there are an enormous number of regional dialects. But hearing in Doctor this time around and her companions is a dialect that's found in South Yorkshire, which is the location of Sheffield. And so they're all using that dialect. But in Modern Who, Doctor has generally had different regional dialects than in Classic Who. In Classic Who, the Doctor almost always had a near-perfect dialect called received pronunciation. And this is also a completely, almost completely artificial dialect. Uh, I doubt you'd find anyone in Great Britain who actually speaks with received pronunciation, though they are often trained with it. And this is the dialect that's used by American actors, actors when they're portraying a British character. But it's also just as inappropriate, and they should learn specific regional dialects. However, that is difficult. Not everybody has my ear for it. Um, in fact, dialect coaches are an actual profession, and sometimes a studio or an actor will hire one. And, uh, you know, I may, may be able to couple of, make a couple of bucks off of it if I really sat down and I've studied the subject for a while. But the inappropriate use of language by British writers and actors is just one of those things that happens to hit one of my hot buttons. So, hey, Chris Chibnall, or anyone else writing scripts involving, involving American characters, please call me. <laughs> um, I can help you write scripts that are more accurate, and I can coach your actors to do American dialects with American cadence. Then there's writing. Just in terms of things, the mechanics of making a film, I always try to bring up writing very first because that's where any TV series starts. If you don't have a script, <laughs> you have nothing to shoot. Whatever's good or bad from a purely dramatic point is always the writer's fault. Now, this episode was written by Nina Metivier. Now, I don't know that that's how she pronounces her last name. Uh, I see it, and it looks like a French word to me, so I'm calling it Metivier. Her credits can prove that she can write. She has been a writer, story editor, producer, and series creator. She won a BAFTA in 2014 for Best Interactive Original. I have no idea what that's an award for. Uh, for the TV series Dixie, which she produced 140 episodes of and wrote 70 of them. She was also the script editor for two episodes of Doctor Who in the Chibnall era. She wrote an okay episode. It wasn't amazing. It was fine, but it's symptomatic of almost all of the Chibnall era Doctor Who. It's fine, just not memorable. The reason for this is really simple. There is no character development, neither of the Doctor nor her companions. Now, I'm going to steal something almost verbatim that was said by someone in a conversation that I had on Facebook in a science fiction group about this very subject, there being no character development for the Doctor and other, her other companions. This is what he said, and I thought it was brilliant. So again, I'm going to repeat this right here. I didn't get his permission to uh, attribute to him, so I'm not going to do that. But if you're watching, hey, wonderful work. I thought it was awesome. It's perfect. Here's my little dramatic reading for it. And I quote this individual from Facebook. I'm convinced that there is an ideological uh, reason why many fe feminist characters don't get proper character development. It comes from the neo-Marxist victim narrative and mentality where all you need to do to have worth as a person is to check off the appropriate boxes to have a sufficient score of victimhood in the oppression Olympi Olympics. What you do doesn't matter. All that matters is how much of your mere existence feeds the victimhood. They want to reinforce the notion that feeding the victim god is all that you need. So they actually want their characters to not have any character development. The idea is to manipulate you into accepting these are good characters based solely on how many victim points they have, thus getting you to buy into the overall political narrative of victimhood. Since that's the goal, not telling a good story, the less character development, the better. It goes be just establishing the, their victim credentials, and that's all. If they started telling actual stories with characters, then you might start liking the characters for reasons other than identity politics. And from their point of view, that's bad. Now, what, what I don't see is how anyone with any degree of basic humanity left in them doesn't see that what's happening and recognize that it is evil 
beyond all reason. Now, at least with something completely horrible like real-life torture porn or snuff films, the perpetrators are trying to get something. Understandable. I mean, sexual pleasure for some people. Out of it. Genocide is typically committed at least with a theoretical goal of security. The way evil generally works is that there's good end goal with a bad means. But this is something else. Even their short-term end goals are bad. But the bad short-term end goals aren't the real reason why SJW is the worst. The real reason is that they have no long-term goals to justify the bad short-term ones. So for contrast, let's look at some examples of real evil from the past. Now, if the Nazis had succeeded in killing every last Jew, then you'd think the Nazis would be happy about their success. If the communists succeeded in burning every capitalism to the ground, burning down Wall Street and seeing that the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest, well, and then rush, ushering in the communist utopian society that they've preached throughout, well, then you'd think that at least be happy about that. But these neo-Marxist types have no goals like that. There are no conditions under which they'd say that they were successful. They are just flat out never happy. And under any conditions, ever. And that is the reason why SJWs are the worst. It's not just because they have evil goals in an but they have no, they have evil short-term goals, but because they have no long-term end goals at all. They have no long-term end goals. There is literally no victory conditions. As long as there are two sneeches left on the beach, then they will be organizing a rights movement for one of them against the other until every last one of them is dead. Now that, my friends, is a beautiful description of what's going on and what is big problem in Doctor Who. Really, that's the entire problem. In the end, he's just appealing to different groups and victimhood and checking off the boxes and has no character development, probably on purpose, as that individual said. Now, Nina, Nina Mativier, well, she contributed to this. I mean, no doubt she was given guidance from Chibnall, but she still wrote a bland script with no character development that, as usual, just kind of checks off the boxes of the victimhood. Now, I usually talk about things like direction, cinematography, production design, music, special effects, costuming, acting. They're all fine. There is nothing particularly memorable. No one is going to win any awards over this. I would mention special dishonorable mention to the makeup because the eyes of that alien creature looked wrong. The eyes did not really match well what was going on around them. And so it looked like eyes sticking back in a mask. The whole thing, the moment I saw it, lost my suspension of disbelief because I went, oh, that looks like a mask. <laughs> So at the end of any review, we would ask ourselves, is it any good? Well, it's okay. Um, you can watch an hour of it, I guess. I don't know. It's okay. Uh, I can't give it much more of a recommendation than that. It's, it's okay. <laughs> and that is all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of The Highly Acclaimed, World Renowned, Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.